So our interview this month is with Dean Edwards. Now, Dean's well-known to TV viewers as a celebrity chef. Uh, he came second in BBC MasterChef Goes Large in 2006 and then decided to leave his career in construction to pursue his love of cooking. Dean made his debut on ITV's This Morning in September 2009. He's now a regular on ITV's morning show Lorraine, and he's also featured on other TV programmes, including Take on the Takeaway, Market Kitchen, QVC, and Saturday Cookbook. Dean's the author of three successful cookbooks entitled Minspiration, Feel Good Family Food, and the bestseller Cook Slow. And Dean's also got his own YouTube channel called Dean Edwards Proper Food. But what most of his viewers don't know is that Dean is also a massive Star Wars fan and collector, and it's in this context that we welcome him to the Vintage Rebellion tonight. Good evening, Dean. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Good evening, guys. Good evening. Um, really, really buzzing to be uh, on your podcast. I've listened in for a long, long time. So uh, you finally got me on. And I will correct you one thing. I've actually written four cookbooks, not three. So the newest one is Cook Slow, Light and Healthy. <laughs> there we go. So you, I better get that plug in. You need to update your website, mate. That's, oh, <laughs> that's God, right. I'm it? doing my research. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice to be speaking to you, Dean. Looking at our collections, we seem to have quite a lot of crossovers. So be be an interesting yes. track, this one, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in, in terms of Star Wars, I think we've, we've sort of met a few times, actually, Jason, um, up at Echo. Uh, yeah, Echo Live are, are, and stuff like that. Are you like that. going to Echo? Because I'm, I'm going to be going, I think. So, Well, do you know what? This year, I didn't think I was going to be able to, but due to what's happening with travel, it actually looks like I'm, I'm going to be available on that date now. So I, I'm actually buzzing. I'm really, really buzzing. It's a great day to get together with like-minded collectors, Star Wars fans. It, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something that my missus is never going to come along with me. But I love it because I get to go up and be an utter geek for the day and the night a lot of the times um, and, and just have a great time just chatting about vintage collecting. It's been far too long, hasn't it? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Absolutely. Um, as I said, you know, it's been a real shame that the last few have, you know, have been cancelled, you know, especially we've got some of the fantastic guests, you know, actors, uh, you know, and some of the talks that they do. You know, these, this is part of the day which makes it really, really special. And I look forward to it so, so much. So the fact it's been cancelled the last couple of times has is, is been, you know, really, really sad. But I think this will make this one even more special um, if, if we can actually get there this year. Talking of books, um, I'm, I'm going to have a book out at Echo. I've, uh, I've written, obviously, this, this uh, Paltoy Carback Guide with Wayne Totti. And, yes. Um, Andy Preston's got a lot of, lot of his mocks are in it as well. So, Well, I will let you into a little secret as well, Jason. I believe some of my Toy Tony figures are, are actually showcased in there. Wayne got me to do some pictures as well, so a few of mine are in there, actually. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I've got a copy on order. Fantastic. Getting into the main, the main text of the, the, question, the preset questions that we, we've got for you, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off with the first one. What was your first experience of Star Wars and what struck you about it? I was actually born in 77. The first real experience I, I truly remember was my uncle taking myself and, and my brother and my cousins to go and watch Return of the Jedi at the local cinema. And just, just being absolutely blown away. It was something that, you know, I'd sort of never really experienced with a film before. And it was something, yeah, something about the characters, the storyline that you just really, truly kind of bought into. And it was off the back of that. It was something that I kind of fell in love with from that moment. And, you know, I'm, I'm 44 now. You know, if any of you guys out there are, are good at doing the maths. Um, but I've, I've been a, a, a fan and a collector ever since. And I think my, funny enough, I kind of went away from the films. I tried to watch the prequels. I hated them. So for me, it was, you know, that was kind of the end of the story for me. I really didn't enjoy them. But what I truly fell in love with was the, the toys and the figures and the design and just everything about it and the, the kind of nostalgia of it. And I think among that time, I, I remember waiting up really late one night. My auntie was living with us at the time and she brought me back my first Star Wars figure, which was a Stormtrooper. On the Empire Strikes Back, I still remember it to this day. And that really 
kind of set me off on my sort of collecting journey and I think along the years I think like most collectors you kind of dip in and out of the hobby funny enough probably like many other collectors as well my mum decided to give away my boyhood collection <laughs> oh, which, no. yes <clears throat> which I've never really forgiven her for I'm not sure she'll be listening to this. I always joke with her and say, you know, I cannot believe it. To be honest with you, that she she gave them to the uh, the local children's home, so I couldn't be too cross. But you know, it's it's taken a lot of time, money, and effort to actually buy back the things that she gave away. But um, when I was in my early teens, and that's really kind of when my collecting bug really kind of started. I managed to keep hold of a a very very small amount of things, um, but like many of us i think i've really enjoyed going to car boot sales i remember being in school and asking friends in school you know got any old star wars toys you want to sell you know really trying to pick up bits and pieces uh for very very cheap prices which actually worked quite well so i built up a really kind of cool loose collection but the thing that really triggered my collecting was uh, a trip to blackpool when i was 11 years old and we were walking past a, a kind of a shop warehousey kind of scenario and outside on one of these kind of a boards you know the folding boards there were a load of star wars figures um all mint on card and it was three for a pound and i was completely blown away so we were away with my nan and i said nan come on you know can we just have a pound please so every day me and my brother we got a pound and we would go back and buy three star wars figures and that's a bargain even for back then three figures i know i know you good isn't it well even more of a bargain what really spiked my journey with collecting especially mocks was the fact that three of the figures that i bought were miscards and i know you're going to broach this a little bit later on but i got um a squid head on a reese card there was a smuggler hand on a bespin hand card and an R2-D2 with a, on, a, on a pop-up card with a sensor scope. And because they were different, unlike all the others that myself and my brother opened up and sort of played with, um, I actually kept those. And they, they're still in my collection now. And nice. I think, yeah, so yeah. You know, they're, they're three figures that I will never kind of willingly let go. Um, but... In terms of, you know, a, a lot of the figures that that really, really spiked my my love of, and and want to collect. So, throughout my sort of teenage years, I used to pick up figures here and there, but it wasn't really until a, a, a few years ago that um, I was introduced to Facebook and Echo Base that I actually really got into collecting properly. So was was Echo your first Facebook group, or how, how how did you find find Star Wars on Facebook? Exactly. Yeah, well, funny funny enough, with considering what I do for a living, you know, the fact that I didn't do any social media was probably really massively a detriment to me um, because that's one way that you can get yourself out there these days, and and most people are doing it. But I wasn't on Facebook, and I was finally convinced to join, um, and. I was introduced because I saw um, one of Tom Scaife's adverts. Do you want to buy any vintage Star We want to buy vintage Star Wars toys. So, you know, I was reading through the little comments on there. And I thought, oh, you know, this is really cool. So I decided to message and say, look, you know, I'm a collector. I have, at the time, I, you know, I had lots of vintage up in the loft in boxes and stuff like that. So I decided to, to touch base with, um, with what turned out to be Tom, who introduced me to Echo Base. And... The rest is history. It, basically, Tom's cost me a lot of money over the last few years. <laughs> good, old, good old Tom. He, cost he's very, lot he's very good at that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So just going back to childhood, Dean, I mean, you, you said very sadly that uh, your childhood collection for the most part went. But did, did you have a large collection as a kid? So I, I didn't really have lots of ships. I remember having an X-Wing, uh, Slave One, Millennium Falcon. But that was about it. And a lot of our, our stuff was given to us by older neighbours. So, you know, I think by the time it, it actually got to us, it was pretty much battered. So I didn't really have lots of the, the ships or anything from, from new. Funnily enough, at, at the time when, when I was a kid, um, 
it was a toss up really between Star Wars in, and, and Action Force. So um, I loved all those. And, and actually, I had more of the sort of vehicles and, and, and ships um, from the Action Force line. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, I, I've, I've always loved toys. And, and I think for me, one of the main reasons to actually get back into collecting was the nostalgia of it. And one of the first figures that I did buy off of uh, Echo Base was uh, a Stormtrooper on an Empire card back. You know, because it really just triggered that sort of that memory for me of of waiting up and just being so excited because I didn't know what she, my auntie was going to bring me home, but uh, that really had a special memory for me. So, in terms of my collecting and my focus, actually, I tend to collect a lot of stuff which has meaning for me and memories. You know, for for that reason, I will never collect Power of the Force because I can't remember it. I'm exactly the same. I've done exactly the same. All the stuff that I had as a kid, if I had something in a in a particular set or range, I've gone and got all of it. And anything that I didn't really have, I haven't touched. Yeah, so, yeah. And yeah. and I think for me as well, I think it's quite important that collections should be not necessarily on show because, you know, we haven't all got understanding partners, <laughs> you know, that will let us just stick toys everywhere. But I think for me, I had a lot of stuff up in, in my loft. And that wasn't kind of why I got into collecting I wanted to enjoy the stuff that I do have so I decided to actually get rid of most of my stuff you know I, I had comics books ships you know I had a lot of boxed kind of ships and toys you know but I didn't really have that nostalgic kind of connection with it so rather than it being up in the loft actually I thought it'd be better to go to a collector that would appreciate it so I actually had a clean out a few years ago and I got rid of that and I I decided to build myself a little cupboard and the idea is that when it reaches full capacity and I only collect mocks now really um when it reaches full capacity it's one in one out it hasn't quite worked out that way because I'm always finding new and inventive ways to squeeze more and more in but <laughs> it's getting to the point now that it's it's pretty jam packed so I, I I will have some decisions to make yeah uh, I'll get a second cupboard mate yeah, that that might be a better option to be. Yeah, that's, that's the way. I, I think that goes for all of us, doesn't it? That, uh, that, that we're, we're far easier at buying than we are at selling. Oh, absolutely. I'm I'm really not um, someone that likes selling because uh, I think it's it's due to the fact most of the stuff that I buy does have a nostalgic kind of element to it for me. Um, I'm not one of these people that would just go out and buy absolutely anything. I, I really do try and keep on a focus because. It's so easy to get sidetracked and, and, and veer off and, oh, I, I really like the look of that or I like the look of this. So, yeah, I'll go down that. And then all of a sudden you've got a, a little side focus going on. And I think sometimes when you take your eye off the ball like that, you don't really kind of end up picking up the things that you really want. So it is a long game. I won't lie to you. When I first joined Echo, I did get a bit excited because... I've not seen a lot of this stuff for so many years. And, you know, back in the day, I'm, I'm obviously from Bristol. You can tell from my dodgy farmer's accent, you know, that there wasn't a lot of shops around here that sold vintage. So I really didn't know where to buy it. And I wasn't as clued up, you know, in terms of the Internet and forums and, and everything like that. So I kind of missed the boat, you know, of collecting in, in the 90s and the 2000s. So I did get carried away. Um, like many people do when they first come in and, and they see, you know, all these amazing figures that they had when they were young. And it was like, oh, wow. Um, but what I love about being in these groups, it's the furthering of knowledge. Um, and there's even so much. You know, I like to think I always like to do my research, you know, when it came to Star Wars and, like, oh, I, I know what I'm talking about. Then you realize you know nothing. So this is, for me, uh, that's the biggest part of it, is, is being educated by people like yourselves. Well, I, I'm the same. People say, oh, you're, you're the expert and such and such. But then there, there's people that I kind of aspire to thinking, you know, how, how can I even know even a fraction of what, say, Gus, Gus Lopez knows? I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's always somebody kind of higher up who you, you're always aspiring to kind of... Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think, you know, in, in terms of aspiring that's see I, I i find 
sometimes there's a, there's a little bit of jealousy knocking around with with collecting as well and and someone like gus has a collection like you know it, it you have to see it to believe it sometimes um and i love seeing collections like that and I, I've, I've seen in the past you know people post up pictures of their collections and and some people take it the wrong way oh you, you know you're showing off you've got this you've got that you know you're showing off your collection do you know what? I love it. I want to see more collections. I want to see as many things as I possibly can, because that's the only way that I can educate myself. But also, you know, I got into this hobby for enjoyment. So it's not about jealousy. So anyone out there with, with collections like Gus and, and Milan and Peter Wong and, and yourselves, show them off. Have that's you got any about. plans to go to Rancho Obi-Wan then? Oh, do you know what? This, this is the one thing I've missed this last year is, is travel. Um, so, you know, obviously it would be incredible to get out to someone like that, but it's it is that hard sell to the uh to the other half of the family, isn't it? Just Closer like, yeah. to home, Jason Joyner is gonna be opening the National Film and Sci Fi Museum, which will have a lot of his Star Wars collectibles and Oh wow. That's gonna be opening this year. That's gonna be in Milton Keynes. That's a bit closer well, to home. That's one that I'm is, to. Yeah, well that's that's a bit closer to home. But I even you know, I get blown away going to Echo Live, you know, just I always have my mind that, you know, I'm going to hopefully go and buy one or two pieces that, that fit my focus, but just wandering around and seeing the, the vintage goodness on show is, is just amazing. Well, it echoes a learning experience in itself, isn't it? The amazing things that are on, on display there. And uh, uh, blimey, if you, know, if, if you had all the money in the world, I, I don't know that you could uh, compl- you, you know, you, you, you couldn't buy everything at Echo. It's just fantastic. <laughs> I was going to say, if you're if you're having trouble selling stuff, just get yourself a table at Echo, and they'll they'll, they'll just Hoover it off you in no time. Oh yes, oh absolutely. Um, but I'm one of those Hooverers, you know. <laughs> I, I I always like to get the little early bird because I you know I dread to think. I always have in mind when you when you go to someone like Echo, you have in mind what you would like to pick up, um, but I would dread the thought that I see someone walking around with something that. I really wanted, you, you know, so you have to kind of get there early. The early bird catches the worm, so to speak. Well, I was going to say that there's the early bird ticket, but as a trader, that you get the early, early bird, and there's an awful lot that happens before the thing even opens for early bird because all the traders are going around and looking at each other's stuff as well. So that's, yeah, that's but, the reason I always but, have a table at one of these things. Yeah, do yeah. you need someone to carry your card backs in this time, Jason? <laughs> Well, yeah, I'm running out of card backs now, funnily enough. But I have picked up quite a lot of other stuff um, in, 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 in the COVID year. So I will have quite a lot on my table, hopefully. I, I remember seeing, Jason, last time um, was your Palatoy Death Star. Oh, uh, yeah. Which you, I think you just recently picked up. And I remember yeah, looking yeah. at it and thinking, Marvelous. oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, that happened again, that happened at Echo. I just set my table up and I just walked down. And I only walked down two tables saw it, asked how much it was, and said, right, well, I'm going straight to the ATM to get that. So, um, yeah, there's some really good stuff you can get, Echo. Yeah, there really is. And and also there are a lot of collectors there that will, will help you. If they, if they know you're specifically looking for something, you know, um, actually over the years, Tom's helped me out quite a bit because obviously he's there setting up. He said, oh, Dean, there's something there that fits your focus. And it's it's really cool to kind of have that community of of friends really you know and and over the years i've got to know many many people in in person that i only kind of got to know through through echo and i really do you know do consider these guys friends and you know the last time we went i uh i ended up sharing more than a few beers probably more than i should have had anyway um you know see this is what it's about it, there is actually a community there as well and um people look out for each other and and that for me is the reason why i'll continue in this hobby for years to come. The social side is great, isn't it? And as you say, that's one of the great things about Echo. You know, it's it's really, really hard getting down that corridor and uh, getting to look at the stuff because every time you turn around, you bump into somebody else. <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think Echo's going to be a bit mental because it, for, for most people, it will be the first big kind of event back after COVID, I would think. But I think it's, yeah. just, it's going to be absolutely, it's going to be full on, I would think. It's going to well, be good. What I've, it's going to be great, but what I promised myself this year is I'm not going to do the stay over on the Saturday night because it gets out of hand. I've got all sorts of videos of 
various collectors singing in nightclubs, you know, and we'd all had far too many drinks, <laughs> but uh, it, it was an absolutely incredible night. But the hangover that I had the next day is not one I want to revisit very, very soon. Oh, the, that, that, the, that's not the good. Friday and Saturday. So Friday night and Saturday night. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, is it, but it, to, to be honest with you, that, that, that is the, one of the main things that I really, truly love about Echo is, is getting to meet fellow collectors. And, and sometimes you're, you're kind of thrust together. And I remember the, the last time I was there, I sat next to um, Andy Van Dyke for, for the meal. And it's great. And we've just built up a, a really, really great relationship. Um, Dan Turrell as well, you know, and, and Shell. It, there's some really fantastic people that I've got to meet over the years through the live event. So any of you listeners uh, that are maybe thinking, oh, shall I or shan't I go along to, to Echo Live? Honestly, it's a great day full of great people. And, you know, if it doesn't blow you away with that kind of nostalgia of seeing that much vintage in one place, um, you're in the wrong hobby. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. So just just going back to your collecting, Dean, um, you were saying uh, when when you got back into collecting as a teenager, you you, you were approaching the the loose set first, getting the loose figures and uh, and so on. And uh, I, I saw on Facebook you built your own display cabinet, didn't you? First off, how, how did you go about that? Well, I did at the time because um, I've, I've actually upgraded now, which is really cool because I managed to grab one of uh, Drew Tegg's cabinets, which are absolutely amazing. They are brilliant, um, aren't they? They are really, really cool. Um, they've all got the built-in LEDs. But I remember seeing these collector cases from the US, and I can't remember the exact company what it was, but basically they built these cases over there, uh, a little bit like what, what, what Drew does over here. But I really wanted one. They didn't ship to the UK. I couldn't find anyone that made, you know, made them in the UK, so I thought, okay, well, let's, let's see what I can do. A little bit of a, a handyman, you know, in my spare time. So I managed to get the graphics sent over from, from the US. And I headed over to B&Q. And <laughs> I got myself some wood, some screws, some paint, you know, all the bits and pieces. And I built my cabinet. And, and I absolutely loved it. So, um, but I actually sold it on in the end because I was redecorating and, and, and stuff like that. So anyway, we've, uh, funny enough, um, we've just built an extension on the house and and the missus came home from from work one day and said why is there like a, a hole in that wall and i'm like ah okay i didn't really want to sort of let her into that little secret yet but um yeah it was specifically built to house one of drew's um cabinets so we've it's actually flush mounted into the the wall rather than sort of standing proud um but yeah lucky for me i've got an understanding missus and she's fantastic you know in terms of she she doesn't you know give me too much jib basically <laughs> but yeah I, you know I, my, time, my time portal i could i put i could put a drew tag in it there you go jason it's meant yeah. to be oh, a, a solution for the time portal I, I don't know if you know dean but we've had this ongoing thing where i've, I've had a, a largest hole in my office wall for um quite a lot of the episodes and we keep trying to figure out uh, ways that we can deal with the problem and uh, i see a drew, a drew tag cabinet inserted in there would be fantastic there you go there you go that's that's you know i i I think it's a perfect way to display loose figures um it reminds me of that that card back scenario and you know it was really important to me that i finished my loose run because that was the first one that i i really tried to do as a teenager and funnily enough i I managed to pick up a few really cool variants along the way Uh, unknowingly basically because i wasn't is educated well i'm not that much educated now to be honest with you but you know i wasn't as educated in terms of variants back then so you know when i've rooted through my collection I was like, oh wow i've got hollow tubes you know what's this shiny metallic best bin blaster i've never seen anything like that before and it was that i think that was my first post on echo um i said you know, just asking knowledge. I said, look, I, I find this one. It's different to all my other best bin blasters. Can someone tell me about it? And, you know, lucky for me, I had a, a couple of messages from admin saying, look, whatever you do, you're going to get messages now, probably. <laughs> um, so ignore those um, and we will give you some knowledge about what it was. And, yeah, somehow I picked up a PPB best bin blaster, um, you know, in, in my collection from 
whether it was from when I was a kid, because I did manage to keep hold of a couple of little bits at my nan's, so my mum couldn't get the, her hands on them. Um, but also, I used to pick up bits and pieces at school, so it, it, it would have came from somewhere in Bristol. But um, yeah, so I was quite lucky in terms of having a pretty cool collection of loose figures. So it was well, a case of just maybe just just tying up those last sort of five or six when I joined Echo. My, my problem with having one of those G-Tag cabinets is that there would be a big hole with the last 17 was because I, I never bought them back in the day and the prices just took off and I never really got on board with it. So Well, I think Drew actually does one with the 79. Well, there you go. But when did, when did you get your last 17? I had them for quite a while before I actually joined Echo. But, oh, well, there you go. But in terms of Echo, they actually helped me complete every figure with the correct accessory um you know that i'm not gonna open up a can of worms here but i wanted my Storm, luke stormtrooper to have a, a solid black blaster um you know so I, it, these little bits and pieces i wanted to actually get for me in terms of what i consider the the correct accessory for all these bits so it was so much better for me to to actually come to a place where i trusted sellers and i actually sort of i, I went down a, a route for a while where actually i I really kind of wanted to get an interesting variant of each figure to go into the case, but I'm, I'm not a hoarder. So um, one, one of each figure is enough for me. Matt uh, Fox but, has done that. I, did, did you, have you ever, ever been to his, um, oh, I forget what he calls it now, Matt Fox's exhibition, uh, May the Toys Be With You, that's the one, no, which, he, which he's been touring with, because he, he's done that. He's got uh, a complete loose run on display there, and he's also got um, a significant variant of each figure. Uh, they really do cool. look really good displayed together like that. Yeah, so, I think, yeah, I think it, it kind of dawned on me that I wasn't going to get a Toxic Limbs. I was going to get, um, you know, a... A, a leddy squid and actually it came back um because i did i had some um, some pretty cool variants uh along the way i actually bought a, a dark brown rebel soldier to go with the metallic blaster and then i actually thought these aren't figures that i remember and and as i mentioned earlier for me it's all about nostalgia so actually that kind of cut short that run and i've moved on most of those variants now um even uh I had a really cool Trilogo FET from my childhood. And I thought, do you know what? There are other things I want. So I've started to become <laughs> a little bit more lenient in terms of what I actually do let go these days. Um, so, you know, I, I try not to, to kind of hoard my childhood kind of things. I know everyone says, you know, keep your childhood toys. But there are other things that excite me more. So, you know, I, I, I am getting better at letting things go, to be honest. Well, now, now you're heavily into collecting carded figures, in particular, the first 12. Can you tell us a bit about that collection and how yeah. you on that as a focus? So it all, it all came about because, you know, somewhere along the line from my childhood, I remember the Palatoy logo, you know, the, the, the big red, white, blue. And I thought, oh, God, that looks good. And I remember seeing an R2 pop up um, and thinking that, is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I know it sounds really sad, you know, that you, you could sort of think of that. And I thought, oh, wow. I wonder what it'd be like to, to own one of those. But I knew actually starting out on a focus like that, it's not the cheapest or easiest focus to complete. So um, I thought, should I, shouldn't I? And um, stupidly, I decided to go for it. I think, um, I think it's easier now than than it was. I mean, when I when I when I did my first twelve back in two thousand six two thousand seven, it was always limited by the Chewbacca because there weren't that many yes. Chewbaccas in circulation. Whereas now you can get a Chewbacca quite easily, and the one that's difficult to get is a Jawa now. For, for yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think you know I was lucky along the way to pick up um, a few. A few which, which is, you know, maybe slightly harder to get. Sometimes I had to venture onto eBay to get what I, I, I needed. Um, but actually, it was, it was a focus I found really hard. It probably took me about two or three years, I think, to, to, to get it. And don't get me wrong, I'm having to um, upgrade a few when I can, crack bubbles, split bubbles. Um, but there's no rush for that because actually, I think sometimes in an acrylic, 
so they look absolutely beautiful. And and over the years as well, I've I've had to trade out some which were a, a amazing condition, beautifully sealed, because something else popped up which I needed. Um, so I think collections evolve, don't they? And we would all love a, a set of fully sealed, unpunched, crystal clear, you know, mocks for whatever our focus is, but it, it doesn't work that way. And sometimes you have to sacrifice a couple of gems to get something that you know really won't pop up. Um, and you mentioned, obviously, like my, my focus was the first 12 characters. So it started off with the, the first 12 characters on Palatoy. And I managed to complete that. Um, and then for me, it kind of went on to the ESB because that's the car back that I truly remember. Um, that's the one I remember seeing in the shops. And, you know, so I thought, OK, well, wouldn't it be really cool to do a run, a first 12 on Empire Strikes Back? And then that led into the Return of the Jedi, which led into Tri Logo. And nice. um, but it's it's really cool just kind of educating yourself because you, you automatically think, oh yeah, you know, like a, it'd be quite easy to get get them on Return of the Jedi. They they must have been made in higher numbers. And you think actually, when you realise that the first twelve characters, apart from you know Vader and 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 the Stormtroopers, they were a lot of them are really tough to get hold of. So I actually found that run. Harder to finish than I did the first 12. Here's one for you. The first 12 characters on Palatoy 41 bag. Now, the thing that limits you there is the, the sand people. And there's yep. three known card backs. And I've got two of them. So if you're trying to do a 41 bag, <laughs> I could be your man on that. You certainly could. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I know your collection's absolutely... In incredible but I, I think you know in terms of the way I, I collect um, I think if I start getting too precious about which car back I have that's a very slippery slope Jason <laughs> well yeah I mean I, I slipped into that right when I started collecting when I, I decided basically I had to have every single Palatoy car back figure variation as a car back there was so but I actually do yes. uh, you know I love it that there are people like yourself out there that that collect like that because this is where the knowledge of collecting comes from. Um, and without you wanting to do that sort of run, we might not know these variants. I, you know, I, I, I see, you know, comment, you yourself commenting on things, you know, quite frequently. Oh, you know, this is a new, a new card back variation that we didn't know about. And, and that's what I love about this hobby. You know, as soon as you think you know it all, there's something new that pops up. You go, oh, wow. Yeah, I, I, I kind of think on, on, on Palatoy that we're, we, we're almost done, which is why when, when Wayne came to me at the start of the year and said, let's do a guide, and it's like, shall we put the Matrix in? And I'm just like, you know what? The, the Matrix doesn't, you know, the last time there was a major thing put on the Matrix was 12C about two or three years ago. Yeah. And there's not been anything since then. So it's just like, well... It's but, hard going to change at this point. So that is forty years after when they first came out, you know. So you you never really know what's going to pop up, and and I think that's that's for me that's the exciting thing about this hobby. We 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 never sort of truly know how hard um, it is to find certain figures until you try and find them. And uh, funnily enough, you know, just a minute ago when I was talking about you know trading some some of my sort of 12 backs. Um, and it, it came about because uh, a Trilogo Jawa came up. Now, when I first decided to do the, the Trilogo run, I really didn't quite, you know, quite comprehend how tough it was going to be to actually get one of those beauties. Um, so wh when I saw one uh, pop up, it was like, oh, this might not be hanging around that long. So sometimes, you know, in this hobby, you have to kind of dive in, you have to go, okay, well, some other things are going to have to bite the bullet, you know, to, to help me get towards this one. But knowing that you're probably going to be able to get those at a later date somewhere along the line. Um, but, you know, there, there are a few things in this hobby which if, if you are truly sort of focused on completing a run, you just, you know, you have to dive on it when the opportunity arises. Absolutely. Yeah, that, 
That first 12 Jawa, sorry, that Troy logo Jawa, that's a real toughie, isn't it? No, that, that's, that's a great one to pick up. Because uh, you know, you've mentioned your um, first 12 run on the Star Wars and Empire cards, but I think you've done it on Jedi and Troy logo as well. Is that yes, right? yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah, so um, I've managed to sort of go all the way through. Um, obviously, on the Troy logo, you can't get the Death Squad Commander. Um, so you're, you're kind of looking at a missed card, which is um, the one I have at the moment has, has a split bubble. So it's kind of, and the figure can come in and out. So it's not truly, you know, you can't class it as, as, as a missed card because it can, it can come out of the bubble. So um, that's is that one. on the ATST driver? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So, and which is the only, you know, a missed card is the only way you're ever going to get a DSC on, on Tri Logo. Um, so they've really grown in popularity in the last last five years. There's a number of people I know who've started collecting missed cards. Well, do you know what? I, I think my my interest in missed cards obviously came due to the fact I picked those ones up when I was uh, younger. And funnily enough, when I sold, you know, I mentioned I sold my um, my collection that I had up in a loft uh, a few years ago. We were looking through the bits and pieces, and annoyingly, there was a card back of a. Gamorrean Guard, um, which had a really small bubble on it, which was obviously a missed card, which I obviously didn't bother keeping. <laughs> so that is, you know, massively frustrating because I, you know, I would never be able to tell which which figure was actually on there. Um, so that's a, that's a huge frustration. But I think we all have our our little kind of moments where we we wish we'd have done something different. So, uh, yeah, um, the, the, the missed cards, as you say, it's a great area for collecting. Um, I've not got one yet, actually. I'd love to have uh, probably just one example uh, for my collection. The, the one that I really like is the C-3PO on the Death Star droid card back, the, which yes, is a the, beautiful colour code combination. I, I, I actually... I guess for me, I would actually love be it. C-3PO and 2-1-B. As, as a 2-1-B focus collector, that'd be my kind of... The, the one Gamma that I... Card, maybe. Yeah, the, the the one I absolutely love is the speeder bike on the R five D four. I think that's so cool. Um, but also, I, I I think if if there was one that I I could get, it would be something Darth Vader related because obviously we got the same accent. We're from the same city, you know. So Darth's always had a little bit of a soft spot, you know, in my heart. So um, I think something Darth related would be, you know, in terms of a miss card, would be something pretty special. One of the is... toy ones, maybe, because there's a there's a Darth Vader on Chewbacca, and there's a General Medin on Chewbacca. Yes, there is actually, yeah. and actually, a, a guy from Bristol actually had that one, um, and I didn't manage to get it unfortunately. But um, yeah, you know, it's they do pop up, and that's uh, one of the reasons. Funny enough, I've I've just um, let a couple of missed cards go to uh, to a fellow collector. Because they just don't pop up anymore. You just don't see them for sale. And I see, you know, a, a few collectors have got incredible collections, and they they really don't like to part with their, their figures. So, um, you know, in, in in terms of missed cards, they were very very few and far between. So, and 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 most of the ones you do see pop up for sale are, are very much the more common ones. And and also, you know, in terms of the bubbles in transit and and the, the likelihood of damage during sending, it's, it makes it a little bit of a, a, a touchy kind of situation for me. So I've, I, I'll, I'll always keep the three that I've had from my childhood, but I'll probably let the other ones go, to be honest. Yeah, it's a great area of collecting. There's, uh, as you said, there's a lot more people uh, who seem to be picking those up now and uh, not, not easy to come by. Um, the next area of your collection that I'd like to go into is, uh, should I say, a little bit controversial. Uh, I know Jason's got an interest in this as well. And this is the Toy Tony carded figures. Toy um, <laughs> Toy, <laughs> Toy Tony. Tony. You're, you're, Anthony. You're, Anthony. You're, yes. you're, good, you're a good friend, Jason. Now, for those yeah. of our listeners who might have been out there living under a rock for the past 10 years, uh, Dean, can you remind us just what a Toy Tony mock is um, and why these appeal to you? Uh, well, in in terms of, I mean, I, I think the first I ever kind of heard, uh, the first time I ever heard of a Toy Tony was watching Jason's interview many, many years ago. And um, so uh, a guy called Anthony basically went to the Palatoy factory and bought up all the, uh, sorry, the, you know, their, their stock of card backs, bubbles, 
um, and basically put together mocks in his living room. Uh, very primitive at, at first, using you know an iron to to heat press the bubbles to the cards, and he would buy up large stocks of figures from eBay, and 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 basically he made Star Wars mocks, mint on card figures um, in his living room, so they weren't factory produced. So in a lot of people's eyes, these are fakes, and they should never be sold. Um, and a lot of groups don't look on them, you know, very favorably. So a lot of groups don't allow you to sell or trade or buy or show or, um, which absolutely, you know, for very, very understandable reasons. Um, and I know a lot of fellow collectors got stung badly. Jason, you, yourself being one. Um, but these were, these were callbacks that started, a, um, you know, obviously, being sold through the 90s and the 2000s and literally <laughs> in their thousands um but they were always very very pristine and and obviously it it all came to light and i'm sure jason will be able to um give a bit more insight on how it all came about that um you know find out but you know through the the internet and forums and it was discovered that he had bought all these card backs up and was basically making them to order yeah, and... he he would do that. I mean, I had I had conversations with him for my two one B run when I said, "Oh, I'm looking for a German two one B," and he says, "Oh, I've got the, I, I've I've got it on the single stem bubble. Oh, I think I've got a double stem one out the back somewhere. If you give me a week, I'll see if I can find it." And obviously, he was just, you know, getting his getting his mint on card maker and then shoving another one in. So uh, yes, I've got several of those. When I started collecting, I kind of went. I don't really know about mocks, and I think I need to. I need to kind of defer to someone like Avery who can tell me whether they're good or not. And I might as well get the best graded ones I can. So I had a complete run of Palatoy Return of the Jedi after ninety. Uh, I think I had a, I, at the point at which I, I found out they were all Tonys. I had about fifteen of those, and every single one was a Tony. So yeah. Yeah, that, and that's a hard lesson to learn, but uh, there you go. But you, you're you're actually collecting. Um, from what I can see, you've got a German run and um, a Palatoy run of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I'm actually you know I'm I'm a bit of a completist when it comes to 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 collecting. So you know if 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 I kind of start on a journey towards something, I do like to kind of get it together. And and obviously they are very very controversial, but. In terms of Toy Tony, it is an important part of collecting history. And yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of of the. I mean, my my opinion of these has probably changed over the years. I was probably very anti when I figured out I'd I'd been I'd been done over. But you, you're right; it's a kind of modern boot. I I kind of think of them as a modern bootleg. So yeah, you know, yeah. all these people who want to say, you know, what we should, you know, and. You know, people like Michael Havens who will publicly rip them off the card and yeah. stuff, and people saying, "Let's write on the back of them." What's what's done is done. So it's been put on the card. It's there on the card. You know, leave them as be. The only thing I just I thought would be a good thing is just to make sure the information to be able to <coughs> tell whether these things are toy Tonys or not toy Tonys is publicly available to everybody, so everybody 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 knows essentially. And for the most part, we can do that now. So. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the the collecting world is also a small world as well. And, um, you know, in terms of the sort of, yes, the information is out there. And, and thanks to, you, you know, people like yourself, um, it is easier to identify these figures. But actually, it's, it's, it's still very, very tricky. Um, but in terms of, you know, this 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 run, um, I kind of knew when I went about it, it was it was going to be con controversial. Um, you know, it's it it was going to probably annoy some some fellow collectors, but I think also for a lot of other people who, yeah, they 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 don't agree with it, they don't approve of it. I don't approve of 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 obviously what what went on, but for me, it is part of collecting history, and most collectors probably have one in their collection, and and I'm seeing very recently, which is actually quite frightening. Some Tonys are going for more than what. A legit mock is worth, which yeah, is well, you can see that they're being accepted again. Because when I when I got mine, I mean, I, I had an Afro ninety um, 
Boba Fett, which cost me 500 quid back in the day. Mm. When I sold it about in 2014, I got like 150 pounds for it, maybe. Yeah. And now, oh, half a 90 return. Even if it's a known Tony, that's that's a four-figure card there. Yeah, well, it yeah. just just ungraded are going for eight nine hundred pounds now, yeah. and which is madness. But actually, what a lot of people I think you see is an opportunity to get a figure which is going to be out of their budget for a budget which is more achievable, um, and it's going to be in incredible condition. Yeah, you know that you know, most most. Return of the Jedi mocks have highly, highly yellowed bubbles. You know, Tony's are always crystal clear. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, so it's and and people like to have one in the collection. Most um, most of the people that I know that that have one in their collection, they want a graded example. Yeah, because I think that was part of the story. You know how Alpha and UKG, we're, we're, we're grading these as legit, you know, so it, it, it unfortunately it is part of the collecting history, but most hobbies have a controversy somewhere <laughs> along their lines, and, and unfortunately this is this is one which costs a lot of people a lot of money, and yeah. um, you, do, you know, it, it... I do have a word of caution about Toy Tony's and collected them as a, as a run, and I noticed this when I sold my run back in 2014, um, so, so, so basically, the bubbles, uh, on the back of the bubble, you, it's heat activated. So when you heat the top of the bubble, that's what, that's what bonds it onto the card. Yeah. Well, obviously, if you've got, if you've got a, a new bubble and a new card and you, and, you, and you put it all through the factory machine in 1983 <laughs> or four, it makes a really good seal. And when he got his, when he got his 10,000, 12,000 card backs and he started making these... He was using bubbles which had been sitting around in the factory for a year or two. So they made really good seals on the cards. Um, but then towards the end of the run, so when, when he got when he got caught in 2013, he'd been going if we'd be going like 20, 30 years mm. ago. The ones that he sealed then, the, the 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 backing had aged, so they didn't make very good seals at all at that point. So the ones that he put on so if you look, if you've got an alpha graded one and you see what year it's graded in, I mean, that's not really an indication as to when the thing was put. Typically, he would put a card together and then it, somebody else would send it off to the graders. Yeah, that, yeah. that's kind of how the, how the thing works. You can tell roughly by the, 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 the date on the, the grade, on the grade as to roughly maybe when it was put together. Yeah. So the ones which are, which are later, closer to 2013 when he stopped, are the ones with the really weak seals, and I noticed when I sold mine um, that some of the seals on my on my cards were just really, really weak. So there were the ones where like a third of it had come off. And when I sold it, you know, I put pictures up and said, "Look, the seal's really bad on this." And blah 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 blah. How were the seals on yours? Because this is that that was back in 2014. We're now seven years later. How, how are the seals looking on these things? Well, if if I'm honest, um, the seals on mine. Apart from one, I've got a, a Bespin guard which has lifted slightly. But apart from that, um, they're, they're all not too bad, actually. But what I would say, and again, it's, it's part of the story. If these bubbles start to fall off, that is part of the story. It's part of what's meant to be with, with, with these figures. So, you know, it's, let's say I, I, don't, I don't personally collect for, you know, financial reasons in in terms of investment or anything like that you know i i collect things that i like um so you know if if, if the bubbles fell off all of them you know at some point i'd you know obviously be a shame but it is what it is and it is part of the story and i think it's very interesting you know especially some of the his early examples which um i'll have to send you a picture of um one of the uh half trooper which is, you know, one of the most common ones. But, you know, there, there are all different sorts of bubbles used. Uh, one of the examples that I have, you know, the bubbles upside down, you can yeah, see that, the iron that's, marks. That's that, very you know. There were a lot that were done with upside down bubbles. The other thing that's not, probably not that well known, is that before the 12,000 card backs that 
Tony got, there was a lot of Boba Fett and I think some Hoth Troopers as well that, that got carded independently. And we I don't know if it was Tony that did it or somebody else that did it, but basically there were there was like hundreds and hundreds of Boba Fetts that were stuck on to the Palatoy 45 back card and they all fell off pretty much immediately, which is why even to this day, you can get it's quite easy to get hold of a Palatoy 45 back card back, and you'll you'll see that the card is a very minimal imprint where the bubble was because it was one of this batch where they all fell off the cards back in the day. So there you go. Yeah, but you know, these these things were were made in their millions, weren't they? You know, so there was, somewhere along the line, there was obviously going to be issues with quality control, and actually, that's one of the reasons I love the Tri Logo uh, run because. Not only is it a run that I remember from when I was a kid, but also I love the fact that they just used to chuck any old weapon in there, you know, and it'd be, uh, you know, <laughs> the miscarded figures are pretty much found on Trilogo car parks. So, you know, I love that, you know, that the fact that towards the end of the run, it was like, ah, uh, you know, just chuck it in there. Um, but I love these sort of bits and pieces. And, and I think that's what keeps collecting fresh for me and it keeps me wanting to collect. It is. It's all a bit quirky, isn't it? And there's always these new little variations, and uh, and, and as you said, the miscards and the errors, and uh, yeah, it it, it keep, keeps it interesting. There's always new things popping up as well. Absolutely. And moving on from uh, from figures, Dean, you've you, you've also got a few non toy collectibles. I know. Um, saw you recently trying to put together the run of the uh, Addis Bubble Bath bottles. How are you getting on with those? <laughs> I've got two to get. I've got two to get. And and, oh, and can again, I guess what they are? Yeah, you certainly can. I'm, well, I'm pretty sure you'll well, be right as well. Well, we, we know what one of them's going to be. That'll be, that'll be our, our old friend, Princess Leia. Certainly is. And the other one, ooh, what else are you going to be missing? Could be any of them, really. All the, all the other ones I find equally not that, that difficult to get, really. Um, Chewbacca. No, I have a Chewbacca, actually. And, and funnily enough, um, that is the only other thing apart from my mocks that I, that I actually still have now. And... That is only due to the fact when I was in senior school, we had a, a shop just down the road from us. We used to go and get our suite, you know, and all that business. Um, and I remember seeing these three Addis Star Wars, you know, <laughs> bubble bath bottles up on the shelf. And they were there. And then the next year they were still there, you know, and it's like, all right, I'm going to have to take these. So I managed to get a Chewbacca, a Luke and a Ben. They've still got the bubble bath in them. And... I had those from when I was around sort of 11, 12 years old. So recently I saw some others pop up and it was like, oh, do you know what? I'd love to complete that. Again, not knowing what I'm getting myself into because, as I mentioned before, I like to complete things. Um, I really didn't realise how hard it was going to be to get the Princess Leia. And the other one that I need to get is the, the Gamorrean Guard. Yeah, the Gamorrean Guard shouldn't be as hard. Funnily enough, our... Uh... Our licensee this month is, funnily enough, going to be Addis as well. So if you listen to that, you'll you'll find out the bits that you're missing. But um, ah, wicked! Of the bottles I've got, I mean, I've only got one that's got liquid in it, but I've got another one where obviously it leaked. You know, it's taken all the as it dribbled down, it took a lot of the text off the bottle. And I think I think I actually bought one, and the the guy asked me said, "It's full. What would you like me to do?" And I just said, "Just just." pour it out because if it leaks in the post it's going to ruin ruin yeah. the, the whole thing so and obviously I, sending I have, liquid through post <laughs> yeah i have emptied all mine out after an unfortunate leaking incident that ruined a few other things in the store were stored in the same box go. so yeah <laughs> yeah when, I, I, mr I preston I'm... has a layer there we go so if we're all really nice to mr preston you might oh. leave it as, in his will <laughs> Well, you, you never know. I've said to you before, Jason, I'll trade it for a set of 10 Helix Felt-Tip pens. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I'm, I'm aware of that potential. <laughs> Is there anything else you're after, Andy? <laughs> uh, oh, uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll message you. <laughs> <laughs> so that, those are the only sort of non-toy things that you're, you're, you're collecting at the moment, are they? Yeah, pretty much. I, I, you know, I mean, I think when it comes to Star Wars, I, I, I really do try and sort of sneak various bits and pieces in and around the house um but without being sort of too obvious and i know you um you've seen the image of my um ig88 head um yes which, i think that's fantastic i'm, I'm I like that. to pick up, that's great 
Yeah, really, really um, happy to have that in my collection. And it's, it's, it's something that I've got on display in, in my living room. And, and what I love about it is I don't think people immediately realise what it is. Um, this this, this know, is the original flame unit from the, the, the Rolls-Royce engine. It is, it is. So it's a, it's a combustion chamber from a Derwent Rolls-Royce jet engine. Um, and I managed to pick up from a guy uh, up, up, up in the Midlands, I believe, who used to break these engines down and really cool, still full of cert and, you know, like that. But, you know, this, this is what they used. And this is what I love about the original Star Wars films is how creative they were when it, it came it? to... Here's a bit of trivia for you, for your, for your uh, IG-88 head. What, what's the first time you see it in the, in the Star Wars film? So I believe it's in the cantina. Yes, three of them. Yeah, so they use it as a light uh, above the bar when they're actually really highly polished as well, aren't they? So um, I remember the guy, you know, when I was talking to him, he said, you know, I can polish it up for you. I'm thinking, nah, you know, leave it weathered. <laughs> you know, this, this is, uh, you know, that's, that's how I can imagine it being on IG-88. Um, but yeah, no, it's really cool. And I've actually seen uh, the, the same guy that I got it from actually polish it up and put a light inside and actually had it as a lamp. And it actually looked really cool. But um, yeah, to be honest with you, I managed to find it quite easily, but I've really struggled to find one now. And I've had you know quite a few people message me over the years looking to, to take on because I, I believe the one that I have is the exact mold that they use for IG-88. There are a few variations where the holes are in slightly different places. Um, so even if it, it is a, a combustion chamber from a Derwent, they can be slightly different. So, um, yeah, you know, I wasn't as <laughs> as into it as that. I would I would know something like that. But I think it's a cool talking piece. And I will use every single you know opportunity that I can to get the, the conversation over to Star Wars. So hence the reason why it's in the living room. It cool. is an incredible display piece. I love it. And what, what about the future, Dean? How do you see your collection growing? I mean, are there other focuses that you want to develop or are there areas of your current focuses that you, you're, you're looking to complete? What, what, what are you going to be after in the future? Well, I, I think, you know, for, for me, if, if opportunity arises, I, 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 I do like to upgrade some of my, uh, some of my figures, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, especially on some of my 12 backs. I, I've got, you know, cracks in some of the bubbles. So ideally... In a world where, you know, everything's rosy and, you know, <laughs> we're able to work at full capacity and everything like that, I would love to upgrade some of those. But I think for me, the, the main focus is to try and complete the, the Rona Toy Tonys. And as you mentioned before, it's, it's not to everyone's taste, but I think there are, there are 54 um, in total different car backs. Um, and I think I'm around sort of around 30-ish at the moment. But there are some really tough ones to get. So um, I would love to get, get all of those and, and get them together in, in one place. And there are probably a lot that um, he may be put together. We don't even know of them, not even on the Matrix. Um, there, so, are you know, there are a few which aren't on the Matrix. I mean, yeah. I, 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 rather than opening a can of worms, I just thought, well, if there's an odd card or two where there's only one or two known examples that are there i'm not going to try and shove them onto the matrix and cause more 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 contamination so so for instance i have um i have a darth vader 45 no darth vader 65 back i think it is yeah hard back with a, a very minimal bubble imprint on it and it's got iron marks across the card and I bought it from Toy Tony. So he's obviously got had a card that he's tried to seal a Vader onto, and it fell off. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's you, that one. And, and there's also um, Jason Joyner has two examples of um, – it's a Leia Bespin German 65-back card, and there's only two known to exist, and he's got them both, and he got those both directly off Tony as well. So I think those were ones where maybe he didn't even try and seal them to the card particularly. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, the, the the full story will probably never come out. But, um, you know, I, I think in, in terms of sort of educating and and everything like that, you know, people like yourself have really brought this to the to the forefront. And, and I think by, you know, I, I, I would really I don't know as far as as far as I know, you might be able to um, tell me 
a little bit further, but I'm not sure whether some, anyone's ever done a, a full run before. Of Tony's? Um, hmm. I would... I would doubt it, because if they were doing a run, they'd be doing their mint on card run, and they just have a mixture. So it's only only given the fact that, that we know, we know that he did them that it's possible to collect that run. So no, I don't think I don't know of anyone who's trying to collect a full run. I mean, I I, I obviously I had, I had my Alpha ninety fifteen Return of the Jedi ones, which I yeah liquidated, but no. I think you probably are quite unique in that. So, no, but, uh, good luck to you. And obviously, if there's anybody out there listening who's uh, got anything they can help Dean out with, um, whether it's uh, a, a a miss card or a Toy Tony, or a Gamma Rayan, or a Leia Addis bubble bath bottle, then uh, you, you know where to find him. It's always great to have an opportunity to, to, to even, you know, sort of speak to kind of like-minded collectors and everything like that, and, and finding out new bits and pieces, you know, along along the way. Um, but yeah, if anyone's got any Tonys they want to get rid of. <laughs> well, most people come to me and they say, is, is my card a Toy Tony? And if I tell them it's a Toy Tony... They're normally kind of quite down, down. Bit, the, you know, the, that that's a bad thing. Whereas with you, if I say it's a toy tone, you'll be going like, "Fantastic! I've got another one." Absolutely. I think with any sort of collecting, you you have to enjoy the chase, don't you? And I I, I love the fact I can educate myself along the way about toy Tony and 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 what stands out as a toy Tony. And obviously, you guys are experts so to speak you know in, in, in jason is especially like you know in terms of identifying these cards and you know there's there's something that you know i'm really trying to learn and educate myself on is as well what what kind of stands out and hopefully i can add to the the, the conversation in, in terms of the toy tony kind of scene um you know in the future i think it would be interesting seeing seeing them all together to see if there's any any anything else that we can spot from seeing that many in one place at the same time versus just seeing it's normally if i see a tony i'm seeing one or two at a time seeing that many yeah what well, might be an interesting thing well funny enough i was chatting to wayne totty the other day who who is um you know his, his knowledge on on tony's is fantastic and we were talking about um unpunched versus punched oh combat. yeah i was talking to wayne about that yeah and it's it's quite interesting. We're trying to sort of do a little bit of research in in terms in terms of that. And and funnily enough, most of the Hoth troopers that I've seen, and I, I own three myself, all with sort of different bubbles and variations. Um, they've all got a, a very strange kind of rub mark on around the punch on there. So you know, obviously these cars were probably seconds. Um, yeah, that that weren't due to be, you know, to, to actually leave the factory. So there's, I think there's still part of the story that is yeah. to tell. The, the, the stack of cards that Tony got, I mean, they they were all there for a number of different reasons. There were ones where like there were blemishes on the cards. So the C three PO with the red dot, they That's a lot correct, of yeah. were failed. Some of them, the the colours were were not printed correctly, or they were misaligned. Um, with the German cards, um, obviously, on the back of the card, they started out at the top saying, uh, collect action figures 1 to 45. And then, obviously, they said, oh, the German market, we've got English text at the top. We'll take that off. So the ones which they hadn't put on on cards, they went into the pile that Tony got. So, I mean, there was a lot of reasons why why, why those cards ended up there. And obviously, since he got so many of the German cards... And the German mint on card market is so small that the actual Toe Tony scandal had a much bigger impact on the German market than it than it ever did on the the, the UK Palatoy market because in the UK Palatoy market there were twenty odd affected cards and you know hundreds of different hundreds of unaffected cards. So, but with the German cards, you know, half the cards out there that you can get are, are Tonys. So obviously, yeah. Much bigger impact. Well, funny enough, I'm I'm part of a German group actually, because again, it's it's about trying to educate myself, you know, in terms of these cards and card backs. And they they recently had a vote. Um, it was a little bit like Brexit. I think there was two percent in it, um, and they voted to not allow the sale of Tony anymore. And I think it's a shame, really, because I think people do need to be educated about. The story because they're, 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure there are still people out there unknowingly buying these figures, um, possibly at full price, 
uh, believing they're getting an absolute legit mock. So I think education is is you know is, is a key part and by sweeping it under the carpet a little bit then you know we we, we never learn in, and we never grow yeah i mean I, um, I i know i know several you know high profile german collectors who went when it all broke they 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 dropped out the hobby for you know a number of years before some of them have come back um and some of them haven't um so yeah it did it did have a big impact there the, the one question i i always ask myself is what would these callbacks and bubbles what would they be worth today? Oh, if they if they if if, if he had sold them without putting the bubbles on the yes. car, he would have made um multiple times what he made off them putting um, figures on the cards. But yeah, the thing I is, believe back, so. Back then, the mock was had more value than maybe an unused card. Whereas now, an unused card because and it, it, it's due to the rarity as well. Because like. The number of cards there was, I mean, basically, if he'd sold them all as unused cards, the un the power toy unused card backs market it would be as big as the pal as the pal as the the Kenner proof card market. Absolutely, size. proof cards. I think there's about six or seven thousand odd Kenner proof cards, and there would have been like twelve thousand of the these cards. It would have been the same kind of size of a market and relative value. You you look at the value of those proof cards now. What the unused card backs would be of a similar a similar kind of value, I, I would think. Yeah, I, I think um, if he would have kept hold of them, he'd, he'd be a very rich man now. They, um, they, they might be there. The, the well, thing that, is, that's, we we never know, do we? We don't know how many he actually made. I think I, I know. I I think I suspect what happened when he got caught out. I reckon he took legal advice, and the legal advice was. Do not sell, do not card any more of these things up and sell them, and do not sell any of the unused cards. If you sell the unused cards, you will be found out and you will go to jail for it. Yes. So as to whether somewhere Tony's got a lock up with you know two or three thousand unused cards that he never managed to finish carding, we'll just not know. I mean, I think the only time that we may find out is when 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 Totally, he's older than us. At some point, he will he, he will pass on. Whoever inherits his estate will be able to legitimately sell what's in his estate. So, if, if that's the only time I can think that they could ever, if they if they exist, if they could come back onto the market again. It, it is a really interesting area of collection, and uh, as uh, as you said earlier, it's certainly a, a big part of the hobby. Uh, it's a it, it's a really good story, and. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how your collection grows in the future. Do 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 keep us posted as you as you acquire more of them. Thank you. Um, we talked a lot about uh, collecting and your your fantastic collection. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on a little bit and have a chat about your your, your day job. Um, <laughs> and you you're obviously on the television. You're mingling with celebrities. You're cooking meals and giving advice on food and. Um, diet and so on. Are you ever able to bring Star Wars into your cooking or, or your, your TV chat? Does, does, does that ever give an opportunity? Well, I've been very fortunate over the years um, to have been been on set on occasions. Um, I worked on Lorraine for nine years on ITV in the mornings. And I remember on a few occasions uh, we had actors from the original Star Wars trilogy. And, you know, I remember being in the kitchen and uh, Dennis Lawson was sat on the sofa with Lorraine and I'm just thinking, oh, wow, <laughs> you know, you just um, a, a pinch of myself, really. You know, you get to meet people like this. Um, but funny enough, the last um, the last time I was on the Steph show on Channel 4 was around the time that they had the big Palatoy auction. Where the Palatoy um, VCJ and they tend to ask us about, you know, things that are current in the news and they said oh do you know anything about star wars i'm like let me stop you there how long do you want me to go on <laughs> um, you, man. yeah so you know they were, they were you know steph piped up and said something about the star wars oh i can't believe how much money and i said hang on these particular figures are incredibly rare you know it's not the old case if you've got you know an, an old Luke Skywalker knocking around in the loft, it's worth lots of money. It's not the case. But, you know, to, to see a Palatoy branded VCJ come up, 
that there's a reason why it went for I think it was 25 grand wasn't it something along those lines um so I was buzzing to be able to give my little bit of knowledge towards uh <laughs> towards that particular thing but I think that's the first time I actually really outed myself as a Star Wars geek on TV anyway that's excellent um, I mean, in terms of other chefs, I know Jamie Oliver likes a bit of vintage, doesn't he? Um, he's a member of uh, Echo Base. I've seen him pop up on there a couple of times. Um, have you met any other celebrity collectors? Um, yes, I have, actually. Um, not, you know, not anyone of the, of the level of Jamie. Jamie's a bit of a hero of mine, to be honest with me. Um, but uh, Tom Fletcher from Busted. Was it Busted or McFly? One of, I think it's McFly. The band he's he's got a big uh, collector of vintage um and i also do know uh richard arnold who does good morning britain he's got a nice yep. little collection i think someone like I, I do keep trying to get it off of him at some point i'm hoping he's going to sell it to me uh because i don't think he's, he collects anymore but he's got every you know he's every now and again he sends me pictures oh look what i found i'm like oh god you know i'd love to get my hands on that sort of thing <laughs> so um yeah you know i think there are uh collectors out there a little bit like you know what, what you see in the collecting groups on on the likes of facebook and and the forums you, you know you you have collectors who collect and are very private with it um i have got one friend who i i, I can't name but he's a uh quite a famous dj who has got an incredible collection you know I, i'm talking he's got all of the you know the power of the force run including the big five uh so, you know, and, and obviously it doesn't really float my boat, to be honest with you, but I can see living in the UK to actually complete that run is is is, is very tough and takes dedication and, I guess, a, a, a nice big fat wallet as well. But um, I'm pretty sure we're going to come across a few more that are quite secretive about their love of Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, crikey, that Power of the Force run, that's an achievement, whoever you are, isn't it? That's, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's one to be applauded. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Um, and finally, I thought let's, uh, as we've got you on and, and, and uh, with the, the, the chef connection, let's have a little bit of food related fun. Now, go, going to the, the Star Wars movies, there aren't all that many occasions when we see the characters eating and drinking, but there are a few. So we've picked out a few scenes um, and uh, just just wanting to know what your take would be. What do you think you'd serve on these occasions so that the, the first one that i've picked out is on tatooine so you're you're in owen lars's moisture farm luke's having breakfast with his aunt and uncle they're sat there um in the uh, in, in the dining area they're drinking the famous blue milk but what do you reckon would be a good breakfast ahead of a day working out on the moisture evaporators well obviously working out on those evaporators is going to be pretty tough work got a lot of heat humidity I mean, the best thing to start that day off would be a nice little bowl of porridge, wouldn't it? Or maybe some overnight oats. So get some oats into a nice uh, container. You pour some of that blue milk in, let it sit overnight in the fridge. Next morning, you want to top that off with some nice fruits, uh, some maybe some strawberries, blueberries, even some pineapple, some dried fruits, some nuts, give it a little bit of texture. So that would be the perfect meal to set Luke up for the day. That sounds great. It looks a lot more appetising than what they were eating. I've, I've, I've always wondered what that is, what, the, what the, uh, sort of pushing around on the plates. But <laughs> no, that, that There was a good. reason they were pushing it around on the plates. <laughs> uh, next one, we, we're moving on to Empire. Um, and Luke arrives on Dagobah and he meets this funny little creature who's going to take him to, uh, to find the Jedi Master. But before that, it's time to eat. And uh, they go into the hut and Luke gets offered a bowl of root leaf stew. So uh, what do you reckon might go into that? And, and I've also said, and uh, uh, putting you on the spot a little bit, I wonder if you might be able to come up with a recipe for us that we and our listeners could ever go out for Yoda's root leaf stew. I mean, I'm not expecting Ooh. it all now, but could, could you ever go at that for us, do you think? Do you know what? I love a challenge. So, yeah, I definitely could, because that's, that's the thing. We, we, when it comes to food, um, it's the only thing... My friends do say I could chat a glass eyeball to sleep. And there's two things that would really, really do that. So Star Wars and food. You get me started on those conversations, you're going to struggle to get away. Um, so, yeah, I can definitely come up with a recipe for that for you. Um, but I think, obviously, looking at that, uh, a stew, it doesn't look the most appetizing. You've only got to look at Luke's face to see it doesn't taste great. He's not that um, impressed, is he? No, no, absolutely not. But I'll tell you the one thing, though, that I always loved about that scene 
there's something for me very primeval cooking over fire. Um, so the fact that he's got it ticking away over a nice little fire and you're thinking, do you know what? You might not have eaten for a little while. Um, so you're bound to be a bit hungry. So anything that's going to be warm, hot and filling is going to be pretty good, even if it doesn't really tickle your taste buds. Um, yeah, well, it's not very honest, nice out there, is it? It's, 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 uh, it's all a bit wet and looks a bit cold. So, uh, yes. yeah, so something, something nice and warming would go down well, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, I, I you know, looking at what they've got to offer out there, I can't imagine, you know, there's there's any really, really fantastical ingredients that you're going to be popping in there to bring the flavours up. But um, I'm pretty sure my version, which I will get working on ASAP, I'm pretty sure we can we can jazz it up a little bit using ingredients that everyone can get at home. Well, that that would be awesome, and we'll definitely have a go before the next <laughs> podcast, and we'll see, we'll see how we get on. <laughs> the ne- the next one um, in Empire, Lando escorts Han, Leia, and Chewie to the banqueting room, where Darth Vader and Boba Fett are waiting for them. And we've always wondered what went on after the scene cut away. Did they all sit down to dinner? What would you serve up? on an occasion like that? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, whilst, whilst they were probably filming that, um, good old Dave Price, he's got a very, very similar accent to mine, he probably said, you're Han, Leah, sit down, I've got some cider for thee. So I would have probably thought that they would have sat down and they would have had some, you know, he would have showcased the best of the West Country. So maybe a bit of belly of pork, braised in some cider, or some scrumpy, you know, a little bit of apple sauce on the side. I think Darth would have been a pretty handy cook, you know, a, a little bit of flame grilling with his lightsaber every now and again. Um, but I'm pretty sure they would have sat down to a nice little banquet there, wouldn't they? And finally, I was going to say, we we have move on to Return of the Jedi. And uh, those cuddly little he- Ewoks have captured our heroes. Now, it's not just cuddly little Ewoks. It's, it's our main man, Tebow, was actually responsible for that. He caught Han Solo and decided to cook him up for dinner Oh, the barbecue. So what we want to know is um, they're obviously doing this banquet in honour of the, the, the new golden god. How would you go about cooking a Wookiee steak? Oh, a Wookiee steak. Now, I mean, when it comes to barbecue, I do love a bit of barbecue. So when it comes to something like that, I love to cook my meat. I've got one of these egg barbecues, you know, so you can regulate oh, the temperature. Yeah, I, I, I see, I've got friends who've bought eggs and they're all going, buy the egg, buy the egg. I mean, I just they're haven't... really, really good because you can use them as not only a bar- uh, barbecue, but you can use them as an oven as well. So you can get that smoky flavour. So, I mean, to me, I would go dirty, which means rub that Wookiee steak with a little bit of oil straight onto the coals using good quality charcoal, two minutes each side, then set that barbecue up for indirect cooking. And you want to cook that steak probably around 25 minutes, 160 degrees in there. You want to cook that indirect. You want to chuck some little soaked wood chips on there, get some of that kind of flavor going up through there. And you want to cook that till it's medium rare. That sounds nice. Yeah. Anyone that says you want that Wookiee steak well done, they don't know what they're on about. Andy, you can have you can have the Yoda stew. I'm having I'm having steaks with uh, with Dean here on uh, that, Chewbacca. Yeah, that sounds good. But I I just hope it's not too chewy. <laughs> Boom! That, that 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 that's that, that that's the that's the winner there for today's yeah. um, on that bombshell of the podcast. <laughs> Well, that's fantastic, Dean. That was a lot of fun. Thank you for uh, for indulging us there. That's brilliant. It's been no. really really good talking to you. We've had a lot of fun. I hope you have too. Yeah, no, absolutely. Very best of luck in your collecting journey, and I hope to catch up in person at Echo Live. Here's to Echo and all the other groups, and also thank you to you guys for having me on. Um, as I said before, like I, I, I love the podcast, um, so it's a real honour to to have taken part, and um, and it's, it's great to chat to fellow minded collectors. Thanks very much. Take care, mate. Cheers, guys. Bye. Right, bye. Cheers. bye. Hello there. You may remember me from The Empire Strikes Back. Now, don't forget to hit subscribe and also click the bell for notifications.